Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Tadros. Um, and today uh, we have uh, another R2P case for you guys. Um, so we have a 47-year-old female with left lower extremity claudication. Um, she has a history of uh, bilateral, one block, uh, calf claudication, which was worked up last year. Uh, she was actually treated uh, already <coughs> for her right SFA disease uh, with atherectomy, angioplasty, and stent placement uh, late last year. And uh, on follow-up uh, exam uh, in clinic, um, she states that her right lower extremity claudication has resolved, uh, but left lower extremity claudication persists and uh, currently interferes with uh, exercise in her ADLs. She's got a history of diabetes, hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease, status post stent and bypass, and uh, she did have a CVA uh, last year, early last year. Her labs are listed below. Next slide, please. She's currently on her uh, uh, aspirin and Plavix for mm -hmm. her coronary uh, stents and her uh, right uh, peripheral stent. You see her vitals listed below. Um, of note, her height is 5'3", uh, which is uh, something that's obviously important for an R2P case. Uh, so she's a good uh, patient candidate. On exam, uh, she has a palpable pulse in the left groin, non-palpable uh, DP and PT. Next slide, please. So on her uh, imaging workup, um, she uh, had an arterial Doppler uh, early this year, which demonstrated that her right SFA stent is patent uh, and has normal velocities throughout. Uh, her left, F left SFA, uh, however, demonstrates uh, uh, elevated velocities, uh, particularly in the mid to distal segment. Um, and uh, she did have uh, false elevation of her ABIs bilaterally. Uh, so, like Dr. Tadros was saying in his presentation earlier, he, uh, he opted to do a CTA uh, on this patient uh, because of the ABIs. Next slide, please. So, we see here that uh, axial CT axial. images uh, demonstrate good uh, arterial inflow bilaterally. Our right SFA stent is patent. And on the left, we see that we have some SFA disease, particularly through mid-distal SFA uh, involving the POP. Lower down, uh, it looks like we have uh, three-vessel runoff bilaterally, um, at least on the CTA. Next slide, please. Go ahead. And so maximal intensity projection images um, through the, uh, uh, the CT uh, that we just saw uh, further delineate uh, her left SFA disease. Um, so we have a little bit of proximal SFA disease, which we can see. <coughs> but it uh, looks like uh, most of the disease is lower down, mid to distal. Next slide, please. Have it. So our uh, final assessment is that we have a 47-year-old female uh, with known PAD, okay. left lower extremity claudication, and evidence of SFA disease on non-invasive testing. Okay. Uh, we're planning for a diagnostic okay. angio today uh, with a radial approach. Um, okay. So considerations uh, for radial approach, and Dr. Tadros already touched on all of these things. Um, Patient height uh, is a major consideration. She's 5'3", once again, so she's, she's uh, a, a great, uh, great patient for this uh, type of procedure. The location of the lesion uh, is also important to consider. Uh, mid to distal SFA is something we definitely can do uh, in a patient of our height or somebody even, even a bit taller uh, with our current uh, devices. And we know that we're dealing with stenosis rather than a CTO. So we don't necessarily need increased pushability or, or anything like that. Uh, that might make us consider anagrade access or, or another uh, uh, groin access. And in addition, uh, we uh, are also going to consider uh, what devices we're going to need for this case. And uh, I'm not going to belabor that. Dr. Tadros just uh, spoke to you guys about uh, the available options for R2P uh, at the current time. I'm going to go through the angiogram of what we found here. So you can see here, this is the distal SFA and popliteal artery, which has several areas of moderately severe stenosis. Um, bulk of the lesion is actually in the popliteal artery, uh, which, which you can see here. There's two vessel runoff through the perineal and the anterior tibial artery. Uh, what we did after that is actually we sent, after shooting the runoff, we actually wanted to see how far we can actually get our 150 length uh, catheter. This is actually a four French glide catheter at 150 length. And you can see we actually are able to get this 
beyond where there's a severe stenosis. So if we need to stent in this location, we can actually su stent successfully with 150 length uh, stent without trouble. Right now, you can see the, this is the five, six slender sheath that we have, uh, which is actually 119 centimeters and is already at the you know, mid SFA uh, right there. So we have plenty of uh, sheath in to be able to treat the area of disease. Go ahead and take the Viper wire. Now this is a 420 length Viper wire. All right, send the wire down to the perineal. All right, so that wire is in the perineal. Stop there. Okay, so now we're going to exchange out our catheter. We're going to set up the uh, CSI system. Exchange this out. Leave this wire here. All right, so this is the I got you wanna, you wanna hold? the 200 length CSI uh, for the SFA and popliteal artery. I chose the 1.5 solid version of this. You can get this in a 125 solid, 15 solid, 175 solid in the long length. Rami, for the audience, what are you flushing through with? Right yes. now, we have this solution that basically is like a lubricant. Uh, the exact contents are I, I, I blank. I know it has some egg in it and some other uh, substances in it, basically to lubricate the CSI system so that the actual atherectomy device doesn't get stuck on the wire. It's important to use this wire, the Viper wire, which is a stainless steel wire. All right, so now we're seeing the, um, the CSI system. All right, so now we're, s we're set up to do the atherectomy. The CSI actually has three speeds, low, medium, high. We're just going to do this with the low uh, speed for now. We have 15 centimeters of throw, so I think we can treat this whole segment. All right, the wire is locked here. So this is a orbital atherectomy, and you want basically a smooth, consistent motion with the uh, with the with the blade. Depending on how much disease there are, the tightness of the stenosis, you may need to uh, go at a slower pace. Um, it's basically like rubbing out pencil with a pencil eraser. That's what I like to tell people. So you can see basically where the tibial plateau is, and its relation to where the lesion is and the tibial tuberosity. And so we're just going to pass this through a couple times. Now, as we're at doing the atherectomy, the system actually notifies us when it's time to flush. And we basically flush the whole system with, the, uh, with this basically lubricant solution. So I think that's, uh, that's adequate for, for our atherectomy. We did three passes, and we got that distal lesion there. So we're going to go ahead and exchange this out. We're going to balloon, and that as long as we get a good result with ballooning, we'll be done. Now you can see this is the Pacific Plus balloon. Unfortunately, we only have a shorter length. So I, I thought a four millimeter balloon was adequate here. Would anybody use a larger balloon? Yeah. No? I mean, based on your original run, your balloon looks well matched to your natural arterial size. So probably not in the popliteal area. I might switch to a five higher up though. Yeah. What are your options for bailout stenting is the question. So um, when we started the procedure, we used a 150 length catheter to get down into this segment. And the 150 length catheter actually gets us beyond these lesions. So in this specific patient, uh, the Everflex with the Intrust system would be, uh, would be a, we could use that for bailout stenting here. So we can use that stent specifically. Wow. In this patient, if she was taller, we might not be able to. Wow, Rami, that looks great. Let's take a look. There's some dissection there, but it doesn't look flow limiting. Yeah. yeah. Would anybody stent this just because there's a dissection or it appears non-flow limiting and we just leave it alone? If it's non-flow limiting, I generally leave it alone, especially in that location because you're pretty close to the joint. So there's a dissection that's yeah. there, but again, not flow limiting. It looks like the obstruction's resolved. The flow is better. Now, 
you can sometimes get arterial spasm with mm -hmm. CSI. If that happens, we'll generally inject nitroglycerin directly into the artery. We so we're getting much better filling into the calf and, and all that. So I think we're done. Would anybody do anything different? No, I think it looks great. I mean, she's got two vessel runoff. You've relieved her obstruction. You know, you've improved circulation. Any other thoughts? No. All right. I all think right. We're everyone enjoy lunch. Thank, Thank you. you.